It is my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker today, Mr. Greg Werkheiser. Greg is a leader edu leadership educator, social entrepreneur, lawyer, and speechwriter. He is co-founder and executive director of the Phoenix Project, a statewide nonprofit organization that educates and engages Virginia's next generation of social entrepreneurs on the front lines of battle to revitalize Virginia's economically and socially distressed communities. Recognized by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching as one of the nation's leading civic educators, he founded and directed the Virginia Citizenship Institute, which over the last decade has prepared hundreds of young Virginians to be more informed, thoughtful, and engaged citizens. Mr. Werkheiser is a contributing author to the Civic Mission of Schools, a national strategy for improving civic education in America's schools, and by appointment of the governor, chaired the Virginia Commission for National Community Service, the body in charge with overseeing AmeriCorps and other federal and state service initiatives. A graduate of the College of William and Mary and the University of Virginia Law School, Mr. Werkheiser represented law clients in federal and state courts and was named pro bono attorney of the year for his precedent-setting work on behalf of Native American tribes. Mr. Werkheiser has served as a speechwriter to a president and first lady of the United States and governor of Virginia. Mr. Werkheiser founded the 120,000 member Virginia Student Coalition to advocate for greater investment in public colleges and universities in the 1990s and guided the next generation of student advocates in their founding of Virginia 21. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Mr. Greg Werkheiser. Families, friends, ladies and gentlemen of the class of 2010, congratulations to you all. Thank you for inviting me to share this incredible moment in your lives. There is a beautiful mystery in this ceremony. Though you have worked so hard over so many years to get here, in just a few short years, you will remember very little of what transpires today. And that's because all of this is about the opening of a door. And we're not designed to remember the doors in our lives, we're designed to remember what we discover behind them. My speech today, may not rank first among your future memories. My words are not going to compete with the proud looks from your parents, the long hugs from your friends, and your own restless anticipation to get to a future that is now so close you can almost taste it. But I do hope to impress upon you one lasting thought. Our world is moving fast, very fast. Faster each decade than in the 10 decades combined. And beyond the door of your graduation is a historic opportunity for you to shape that world for the greater good. Now that's pretty heavy stuff. Perhaps more heavy than you wanted to think about today. For you, the future is about more immediate concerns. For instance, will your freshman roommate have issues with body odor? How long will your parents allow you to stay in your old room before they start charging you rent? The answer to those questions, incidentally, is probably in about three months. Look, I know firsthand how difficult it is to accurately predict one's future. I'm 36 years old. My high school graduation was exactly half of my lifetime ago. No one at my graduation would have ever guessed that in 18 years I'd be invited to deliver a commencement address at a prison, let alone a high school graduation. And who could blame them? 
I proudly sported a mullet for a haircut. I wore way too much cologne because my after-school job at an industrial laundry involved shaking chicken parts and maggots out of dish towels. Mm. My grades were so mediocre that I would not graduate unless I scored at least a B plus on my final in human anatomy. I did, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank an old girlfriend whose extracurricular help uh, made that possible. <laughs> And as I sat at my graduation ceremony down there, and the speaker droned on, I closed my eyes and I imagined my own bright future, and I could see it as clear as day. I was gonna get a job with this new company I just heard about, it was called Internet. I had no idea what they manufactured at Internet, but my plan was to get a job in the mailroom and work my way up to be the boss. It's true, they might have asked me to cut my mullet, but it was going to be worth it. Because when I earned enough money, I would travel to Hollywood, and I would win the heart of the girl of my dreams. Her name was Julia. Julia Roberts. <laughs> so it should be clear by now that I had no idea of the personal or professional challenges that would actually shape my life over the next 18 years. None of that was part of my consciousness. Now some of you might say, Greg, it doesn't sound like you had much consciousness. Uh, and maybe you're right. Maybe you, all of you down there in the green, are smarter. And you've got a plan. And you know exactly where you're going to be and who you will be when you're twice your age in the year 2028. But here are three reasons why whatever you think your future is, is probably dead wrong. First, experts predict that between now and 2028, members of the class of 2010 will have held at least 10 different jobs. Many of those jobs will be for enterprises that have yet to be invented. The second reason you don't know who you're gonna be in the year 2028 is because you will probably be at least three different people by the time you get there. That's because every cell in your body, with the exception of a few in your brain, will have been fully recycled at least three times over. My wife says that she is waiting for version 5.0 of me and hopes that he will do more work around the house. The third challenge to predicting your future is what I like to call the Star Trek effect. Leading futurists like Ray Kurzweil say that by 2028, the collective computing power of all the computer processors in the world will have surpassed the brain power of all the human brains in the world. By 2028, tiny computers will be deeply ingrained in our bodies, our brains, and our environment. Heck, instead of holding an iPhone in your hand, the iPhone will be your hand. <laughs> And in that future, in that technology-heavy future, the implications for overcoming poverty, pollution, disease, and educational disparities are profound. And so are the risks. And that's why we need you to become what folks call social entrepreneurs. That's someone who develops the knowledge and the skills required to harness change and to shape the world around them. Social entrepreneurs love wrestling with society's most difficult challenges and finding new approaches and new solutions that impact more people and that are sustainable over time. They feel equally comfortable working in the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector, or for government because they know that they don't have to choose between making money and making a difference. They can do both. In short, social entrepreneurs are like that guy with the beard in the Dos Equis commercial. They're the most interesting people in the world. Your generation's idealism, your fearlessness, some would say your insanity, your lack of prejudice, 
and your grasp of technology give you the potential to lead us in the decades ahead. And I say potential because that's all that it is. What you inherit today is not a birthright, but an opportunity. I love the old story about Thomas Jefferson when he was your age. He had a wise old teacher named George Wythe. When Wythe died, he left to Jefferson two silver chalices. The chalices were beautiful, and Jefferson cherished them and put them on a shelf where they stood for many years. But one day, Jefferson took the chalices and sent them off to a silversmith with instructions that they be melted down and recast into eight smaller cups. Now many folks would be horrified that Jefferson essentially destroyed his teacher's gift, but because Jefferson reshaped those cups, more people could and did drink from them. And they were cherished by Jefferson and his grandchildren for generations. Of course there's a lesson in that story. You too are the beneficiaries of wonderful gifts. But you must take the gifts of knowledge and experience imparted to you by your teachers and your parents and all of those who have come before and recast it for the challenges of your time. My daughter, Amelia, who is here today and not crying, was born a little over four months ago at the height of the first blizzard in February, the snowpocalypse. When Amelia graduates from high school, Maybe one of you will deliver her graduation address. I urge you to live a life that would allow you to say to her, I took the world that was given to me and I reshaped it and I recast it so that more people could drink from the promise that it holds. So please allow me in closing a point of personal privilege. It's possible that in this fast paced age, this speech may be captured on YouTube, and it may be seen by someone from my distant past. You know who you are, Julia Roberts. <laughs> and I would just like to say to you that I'm a different man than I was when I was 18. So please, do not try to call me at 703-408. Stallions, you are the pride of South County. Wherever you go, whatever you do, remember that the people who share this celebration with you in this arena today want only so much as to be the wind at your backs. Thank you and Godspeed.